listening to That Gets My Goat. I'm very, very sorry. You probably have to make a decision ahead of time. Am I ever going to try to cross these worlds together? And do I ever want anybody to know that I'm writing as Jane Smithers when my real name is John Smothers? Or Excellent like Smithers. <laughs> You know, I think that that's one of the, I mean, eventually you would want anything that you wrote to be found by the people that like your writing. Right. So I would think that eventually, I don't know, maybe on your Wikipedia page or something, you put this guy all writes as under this pseudonym or whatever. So right. people who get interested enough in your stuff to finally go and look at your Wikipedia page, they could discover that, that both of these are you. And then they could go from one to the other because they would trust you as a storyteller, I would think. And if they have any interest in whatever other genre you're writing in, they would give it a chance. Because, you know, you want these people to buy. But also, yeah, I, 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 there's always that, do you pick it up? Are you going to be left in obscurity or is somebody going to actually pick that book up yeah. and uh, look at it? And, yeah, I mean, there is that. Will a woman read a mystery uh, Sorry. Will a woman read a romance novel written by a man? I, well, we've had a really good example recently. Uh, and, and it's topical because I'm reading it right now. Well, there's a writer named Robert Galbraith that put out his first book called The Cuckoo's Calling. And what, would that have been November or October? Sometime in 2013, this guy's first book came out. And it's a, a mis it's the first in a mystery series. Uh, it's about a, a, a private eye in London who's a, a, a vet of the Iraq war and he lost one of his legs in Afghanistan. Not the Iraq war, sorry. He lost one of his legs in Afghanistan and, uh, it, it has a lot about, you know, this guy's longing to be part of the, the military again and, 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 you know, the loneliness of, that nobody can understand what he has gone through, kind of stuff. Um, have you heard of this at all? Do you know what I'm? Just, you, you know where I'm saw going? That you had posted on. Okay, the book came out, and it it sold out its first print run, which I think was 1,500 copies, and it was at like 7,000 on Amazon's, you know, top million or whatever you want to call of sales, and then it came out that Robert Galbraith didn't exist, and this is actually J.K. Rowling. Who had created a pseudonym and was going, uh, had already written two of these books, and she had gotten a book deal and were, was going to put these out. And according to her, it was she wanted to just be able to put stuff out and have people review them and read them. And if they respond to them, it's because of the book, but not because of who wrote it. The most successful writer in yeah. history, or have the you know the jacket writer, the creator of Harry Potter. And when that came out, how it came out was the wife of one of the people in the publishing house tweeted, who, you know, Robert Galbraith is J.K. Rowling, you know, I found this out today or whatever. And when the news came out, the book jumped to number one on the Amazon bestseller list and millions of copies have been sold. But she was really upset by this. Anybody else in this room or in this planet would be thrilled that suddenly millions of, of your books have been sold. But she's like one of three or four writers who can afford to say, I don't care if nobody buys my book. She had a certain freedom, she felt, in creating Robert Galbraith. And she had come up with like a backstory of who he was. And she had even gone as far as to put out advanced readers copies and autographed copies signing Robert Gal Galbraith and stuff like that which I guess you would do if you were a beginning writer kind of thing. And then and she was hurt and, and felt betrayed when the truth came out because now she's not going to just be able to release all these books in the same way. And, and, you know, maybe that's white people's problems. Maybe that's, so let's all shed a tear for J.K. Rowling well, and all that. But I, I feel for her because I've been enjoying the hell out of this book and I don't know if it's because the book is really, really well written, or it's because, hey, this woman wrote stuff that totally lit up my imagination. I love her. So I love the thing that she's writing right now. So you knew as before you read it 
Yeah, that's the and and, and that's the it's a double edged sword. The only reason I picked up the book was because I knew who had really written it, and so I wouldn't be reading it right now if. Yeah, unless you wouldn't be reading it right now, but the possibility is that you might eventually. I mean, first-time writers hit it big. They put out a book. I mean, Stephanie Meyer's first book was uh, Twilight, and she's only got four, I think, ever published. No, five, I guess, because there was that other one. And yeah, I mean, she's that same kind of deal. It just the first book just took off, and it may have eventually made it to you. That's, you know, one of the things that maybe I think Rowling would have loved to have found out if she could make it big with another book under a completely different name. See, the funny thing is, and not totally funny because you checked both of these books out and handed me the one of them and you took the other one, but I'm listening to the audiobook of J.K. Rowling's other post Harry Potter book, which was called A Casual Vacancy. And this book was written under her actual name. And it was put out, it was for adults, it says. I don't know how many, I hope everybody realized this and made sure that they understood this before their kids ever got their hands on it, because it is. It's for adults. Yeah, it's she got, had a different imprint put this out. And she, as part of her contract was, you cannot mention by the writer of Harry Potter on the flap or on the back or any of that stuff, you know, it's like, because, yeah, it's, it's got a lot of harsh, a lot of harsh language in it. And it's got, you know, characters that are awful. And it's got talk about sexuality and stuff like that in it that you wouldn't want the YA kids getting into and reading. But, yeah, the funny thing is, I'm reading that. You're reading the other one. I know that it's J.K. Rowling, and I would have known it no matter what. But I'm not enjoying it as much as I have enjoyed other rolling writing. Uh, I'm not sure what it is. I think it just, it's still missing that Harry Potter character, the guy that you can latch on to and be like, yes, go, Harry, you can do it. Instead, there's all these characters that are all kind of a little bit despicable. Every last one of them is despicable in one way or another. And I'm having a hard time caring about any of them. I'm hoping that a bomb drops on Pagford at the end of the the, the story and, and we're spared any of these people anymore. Okay, but <clears throat> let's say that A Casual Vacancy was written by Robert Galbraith. Would you have stopped reading it by now, not liking it the way you are, had it not been J.K. Rowling that was writing? You know what I mean? Do you feel an obligation or a sort of affection f toward her where it's like, well, no, I'll give it, I'll give it some more. Because I know she can write stuff I love. Mm -hmm. I don't feel an obligation, I don't think, to keep reading it. It's good enough. It's well enough written to where it keeps my interest, at least. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've read some other stuff recently, or listened to, I should say. I hardly read anything, but I listen to a lot of books. My mommy reads them to me. The uh, I've listened to some other stuff recently that uh, just I, I couldn't get into it to the point that I just gave up on it. I didn't want to fall asleep on my drive. And that's actually a possibility, depending on how things are, depending on how well the baby sleeps uh, at night. So, you know, when, when it's just dull, there's been, and there's been some by uh, writers that I love. And sometimes I think it may well even just be the production of it, because sometimes the production is just not uh, what really makes it pop. You know, they have a writer that, talks in kind of a monotone, quiet, soft, soothing voice, and after a while you feel your your eyelids drooping. But yeah, I mean, I had Isaac Asimov story that I was trying. I like Isaac Asimov. I've read lots of his books, and but this I couldn't get through it. Because of the reader or because of how the book was? I'm not sure. I can't say for certain. The reader was one like that that was talking in a, in a nice, soft, sonorous voice. But the story never grabbed me either, so I'm not sure what it is that was behind that. But yeah, I, and it wasn't even a long one. It was like a three-hour thing, and I quit halfway through because I couldn't take it. Uh, well, one thing that really distressed me, though, was on Amazon.com, there are hundreds of one-star reviews of The Cuckoo's Calling by Robert Galbraith, where they explicitly say, I have not read this book. But screw J.K. Rowling for trying to, for lying to us or for, you know, whatever. 
And I, 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 there's no justice in the world if that is counted as a review. I mean, somebody at Amazon needs to take all of those and say, delete. If you come right out and say, I haven't read this book. And so I, there, there has been a backlash on that. But part of me is just like, well, why? What, what is the problem that she, you know what I mean? Okay, yeah, I mean, she tr tried to write from a different perspective. And, and that was something I was telling you today during the drive is that, you know, the thoughts that go through this guy's mind, Cormorant Strike, the main character in the book, feel like something a man would really feel. And, you know, it's just like, well, why can't women just let me say I had a bad day and, and then leave me alone? Why do they have to know every single little detail? Why do they have to just jab and jab? Please just leave me alone if you care. And I think every man has felt that at one point or another. And, and you know, for a, a female writer to convey that, it struck me as, wow, that's that's particularly insightful. But if it had just been a dude, Robert Galbraith, who had written that line, I wouldn't have been like, oh, I would have just been like, yeah, you're telling me, brother. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it, it has altered the way that I'm reading the book, and, I, and that's a shame. It would have been really neat to come on to this series after there have been three or four and have somebody say, hey, you know what I think you would like? And uh, I, it's a shame that the, the, the news came out the way it did, because it would be fun if you read a sentence and there was like, wait a second, wasn't there a part in Deathly Hallows? And you go through and you're just like, these two sentences are the same. You read a sentence you know what I'm and saying? it said, Cormorant Strike said darkly. Okay. You're like, what? Wait a minute. I, I kid you not. There was one <laughs> in the very first chapter of the book. She asked querulously. And I was just like, oh, come on, Harry Potter. How else do you ask something? Where I was just like, okay, that's what J.K. Rowling used to do during the Harry Potters all the time. I mean, darkly is the worst example because I hate that word. But she asked querulously. That was the only indication I ever got during the book where it was like, hey, J.K. Rowling wrote this. <laughs> anyway, I just think it would be neat if people were just like, oh, I wonder if, or, or if they, it had just had its own following based on the quality of the writing. And now we'll never know that. I, maybe not. Maybe she's just like, you know what, for my third book, we're going to make up yet another name. And we're going to try even harder. It's like my brother-in-law or whatever is going to be the person that signs the copies and, and sends out the letters. And there'll be no way to trace it to me. And, and I, I don't know. I mean, if you're a billionaire, you can afford to, to have all these fun little experiments. You hire Ben Kingsley to pretend to be you on your crazy <laughs> commercials that you put out That's when right. you take over the airwaves. <laughs> I mean, she could totally afford Ben Kingsley, I'm sure. He could be Robert Galbraith. He's like, yes, I am Robert Galbraith. <laughs> That's right. Listen to that. That's Mandarin voice. In that little th little short, somebody in the prison says, come on, do the voice. Do the voice. And he's like, America has reached the air, or whatever. And I'll go, yeah, kind of thing. <laughs> anyway, um. Uh, Yes, well, she she's rich enough to buy Ben Kingsley, but you know that's yeah. We... But see, she probably feels like she she can't be her writing can't be validated by itself alone. It ha it everything comes with her persona and her that everybody knows who who she is, and so th will they read her stuff because it's her, or will they read it because it's good? She's probably was probably trying to figure that out. Yeah, I'm sure that is what she was trying to do, and and that you know that makes me think of uh, Joe Hill as well. Right. You know, you guys talk about Stephen King. Well, Joe Hill is Stephen King's son, and so I'm sure he felt like he needed to set himself apart from his dad's writing. He wasn't just writing on his dad's coattails. Right. See, that strikes me as incredibly brave, because you know this guy would have sold way more books at first. If it had just been, I'm Joseph King. Because you can't publish as Joe King. Sorry. <laughs> but, it, about Joe Ma? but you know and, what I mean? It's, it's... And Lee Joe King. <laughs> Piece of crap. <laughs> but, you know, I think he, he just wanted to say, hey, I want the proof to be in the pudding. I want the words to speak for themselves. I wouldn't have that kind of confidence. or whatever, You know what I mean? It's just like, if I can sell ten times as many books... Just by saying, hey, I'm really this guy. Well, maybe you, if you're Joe King, you know, when my dad dies, I've got all that money. 
in perpetuity, 75 years past his death. It'll just keep coming in because the I'm the estate of Stephen King. So he, he's kind of like Joe Rowling where he can just, you know, I don't have to make money. I, I've got money. I want to be somebody. I want to be a contender. And I really like Joe Hill's writing. I don't know if you've ever read any of his stuff. I don't think I have. I've read some of his short stories, and it's all good. I, I think it's really, really good. But I would never have picked up any of that stuff if I didn't know who his dad was. You know what I mean? It's yeah. so like, I, how would I in Podunk, Mississippi, have ever even have heard of Joe Hill if I hadn't read somewhere? Oh, hey, his dad's Stephen King. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of the, the Galbraith thing again. Yeah, I think what Rowling needs to do is just keep publishing and publishing and publishing and publishing, not become like Stephanie Meyer, who seems to be done. She's um, doing you a favor, though, really. Possibly. But, you know, she needs to just keep publishing, be like Stephen King. He put a book out, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one. And eventually, it wasn't just, oh, this is the Stephen King book. It was, you know, Stephen King's got a new book. Yeah, this one's not very good. Oh, this one's good. You know, they they judge by what it is, because there's 40 of them. Right. You know, and you don't just, oh, wow, there's finally another offering from the goddess J.K. Rowling. <laughs> You know, it's it, if she just kept going, 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 like, you know, and just as soon as Harry Potter was done, she did the next thing and the next thing, then she would have a whole nother seven or more books out by now. Well, do you think she's at all afraid of publishing another fantasy novel or another YA thing, another children's book, because it will always be in the immense shadow of Harry Potter? Probably. But, again, I think it's the same thing, man. Do it. Put out one, put out two, put out three. Maybe you can be rolled doll instead of just being Harry Potter's author. You know, you put out dozens of these books that, that kids still talk about. And, you know, they don't talk about all of his books. But they sure love Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and they sure love some of the other ones. You know, they, they love Matilda. They love James and the Giant Peach. They love the BFG I'm not even getting the name of it right, the witches or something like that. You know, they love them all. Sorry. They, they don't, don't love, love them all. all. But they love a lot of them, <laughs> I should say. And that's what I think she needs to do. Just go for it. Make yourself a, a legacy beyond Harry Potter. Just, you know, do it all. Write your Cuckoo's Calling series and write your anything else, you know? I mean, it can be like you and I where we're here saying, okay, you know, I really liked Harry Potter and I also really like The Cuckoo's Calling. Not such a fan of uh, Casual Vacancy, but, you know, can't win them all. That would be fine, I think. That's the way most writers work. But because she made a bajillion dollars off of her first series, she seems to be stuck. Did you ever get to say what you wanted to say? Well, I was going to bring up Joe Hill. I, I mean, you brought up Joe Hill just in case you've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> a few minutes ago, you asked me of what... Dean Wesley Smith said. Oh, right. Yeah, that was actually a long damn time ago. It was a long time ago, but I figured I would bring it up here at, at the end. I've forgotten. Did I? Who was it I asked again? I, I don't remember anymore. It's been so long. Okay. <laughs> I thought it's been a pretty riveting discussion, but all right. This, this one may be our casual vacancy, folks. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> one thing that Dean Wesley Smith has said repeatedly, and he's one of those guys where I think he's really outspoken and he has a, like a daily blog or weekly blog. And a lot of the stuff he says is over and over again, not because he's pedantic or anything, but because he really feels strongly about this point. And one of his points is publish everything. Now that we're in the 21st century and you can self-publish your own work, put it all out there. If this story is terrible, to publish it. Am I wrong? Am I? No, I think that's true. Yeah. If you it's... think it's a terrible, well, you're not the reader. There's surely readers out there that are going to think, oh, I love this story. See, and, and that's something that's been really, really hard for me to get over. You, If you've ever listened to my solo podcast, at Marshall, you probably know this because you have listened to it. I always say, uh, this isn't a very good story. I, I realize that. It's science fiction stories about people that come down from other planets. I say that. But I would not be sharing the story with you, even on a solo podcast, if I didn't think it had some merit. And there are some stories that I wrote, have written that I think are just awful. And part of me 
says, well, nobody should ever read these stories. And another part says, well, yes, but Dean Wesley Smith has published everything. Maybe these could be under pseudonyms. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I, I don't know. If somebody stumbles across one of my stories, and let's say that they pay for it, because that's another thing Dean Wesley Smith has said. Uh, he wrote this really, I, I, can we put a link to it in the show notes? He wrote a, an article about how to publish in the 21st century. And a lot of it is self-publishing, but you know you can still st send your stuff to magazines, you can still send your stuff to anthologies and all that. But just now that you can, put out everything you write, self-publish it on Amazon or on certain of these other websites, and always put a price tag on it. That's something that he said. And he said it has to be at least $2.99 for a short story, which to me seems like so much money. And when I first started publishing on Smashwords... I felt like, well, some of these things I'm going to put out for free, and then some things I'm going to put a dollar sign on, because my thought was, if somebody reads subtext for free and they liked it, maybe they'll give me a couple of bucks for the Scottish scene, you know, something like that. Whereas, like, I've got several things that you can read for free that gives you a taste of who I am and how my writing is. Hopefully you'll like it enough to spend money. That seems logical to me, but it flies in the face of what Dean Leslie Smith is saying, and part of me wonders, well, if he's right, should I be charging for a slight delay or a subtext and all that? Am I throwing money away by getting something for free? Well, it's possible that you're throwing money away because people may have paid for it. Usually it seems like the way you do it is the stories that you give away are the really, really short ones. And then the ones that are a little longer up to are really long. Um, are the ones that you actually charge for, which that seems fair. I mean, the, the sad story of the Minnesota diarrhea ghost, it's short. It's like two or three paragraphs, you know. It's not something, it's it's something where someone would be upset <laughs> if they paid. And then, what the hell? That's it? <laughs> what a page! And yeah, we're, what a half page. we're kind of going toward that with, with what I was saying. There are stories that I've written that I don't think are very good. And what if I put one of those out there and it has a dollar sign on it and somebody bought it and they thought, I'm never reading this guy's stuff again. Yeah, see, my idea for that, and I, I think I shared you my list of the ones that I think stand alone and the ones that I think don't. My idea was there are some that I could publish by themselves and others that I probably ought to include as part of a anthology or a collection of my stories. This one, eh, I don't think it's very good, so I'll throw it in along with these others that I think are good. And then hopefully when somebody spends money on it, they'll be like, well, that one was, it was silly and stuff, but it wasn't bad. It wasn't, and this one was really good, and this one was great, or whatever. Hopefully that is what they would think. And so, you know, this one was silly, yeah, but it wasn't, this one sucked, and this one was awful. Um, I hope that's not the reaction they get. What do you think of that, Marshall? No, I think that's, that's a good way to go about it, because then... They're still getting something that they would like. I mean, if, if they like one story and don't like another. But is Big qualified to say this story is not good, this story is good, since he wrote it and put his heart and soul into it? Do you put your heart and soul in all of your stories? Are there some that are no, half-assed and you I'd realize totally it? I mail them all in, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I'm not even trying. That, that seems fair, though. But if I bought a story for free, or if I didn't pay for a story... I probably wouldn't feel that put out if I didn't like it either. Okay. But it, the price is weighed into your reaction toward the story? Probably, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely the case. That's something that Dean Wesley Smith has said on his blog where he talks about the big publishers putting out audiobooks and then the self-published people putting out audiobooks. And in general, the self-published stuff gets higher reader feedback. They get more stars on their uh, ratings than the stuff that comes from the big publishers. And the majority of the reason behind that, they think, is because big publishers charge more for their audiobooks than the people that are doing self-publishing. And therefore, when you paid more, you expect more from it. And when you only get something that's just as good as a self-published or sometimes lower quality than some self-published stuff that you read, you're upset. When you paid hardly anything and you're like, wow, this was awesome, then you rate it with the five stars or the ten stars, however many stars, I don't know how many stars you're allowed. Fifty stars? No. 
in your case, so three. For everybody else, five. Oh, okay. So, um, uh, but at this, yeah, Dean Wesley Smith had said put a, put two ninety nine at least on everything, and the reason he said two ninety nine is that's the cutoff on Amazon. If it's less than two ninety nine, Amazon keeps seventy percent, and you keep thirty percent. Is that correct? Uh huh. If it's over two ninety nine, you keep seventy percent, and they keep thirty percent. And yeah, why would you deny yourself? And, and it's logical. As a, a somebody who needs money to survive, why would you deny yourself? But there are stories that I've written where I would just I would feel like I was ripping somebody off to charge three dollars for it. Throw it into a collection. Okay, I mean I I hear you and I agree, but that's not what Dean Wesley Smith says. And the guy makes a living from his writing. It's just, it's it's hard to decide. Anyway, I, I, this is all sidetracked. I'm sorry, guys. The question was, I emailed Dean Wesley Smith because I did a search on his blog to see if he'd ever talked about pseudonyms. Because I don't know, you know, there's some things that I've written and I want it to be in a different guy. Should I make up a, a name for this guy that writes the bad stories or that writes dirty stories or that writes religious stories? And I don't know. And so I asked him, you know, what is your advice about pseudonyms? And, and he said, I'm currently in the process of collapsing all of my pseudonyms back to Dean Wesley Smith. And he said, except for in the case of erotica, there's no need for pseudonyms in this day and age. And that was it. It was like a two-sentence thing, because he's a busy man, I guess. I, I think I would agree with that. I mean, obviously, Dave, Daniel Abraham thinks he needs to do that. But I think when most of your stuff is going to be read online or through somebody listening to something... You need one name to stand behind it. It doesn't have to be your own name. It can be a pseudonym in and of itself. But you don't need different pseudonyms or different names for different stories, except probably erotica. Yeah, I think it's weird Daniel Abraham has different names for fantasy, science fiction, and horror because those genres all seem to go hand in hand. You know, the, when you say, you know, genre fiction or whatever, they're talking those three, basically. Or you say speculative fiction. You're saying all those combined. And a lot of times those all meld together. There's sci-fi stories with vampires in them. Or there's fantasy stories that have mechanical men in them. And there's all three of them that have horrific elements to them. And, yeah, I mean, it seems like the audience goes hand in hand. So why would you want to... I mean, I can understand, okay, I need something different for romance because that's going to be a completely different audience and they're not going to want to be they're going to be like you got your peanut butter in my chocolate that i can see but a different name for sci-fi than fantasy i don't yeah i mean see i guess any purpose as, to that as i heard myself say that too i thought i was you know i was probably being hypocritical because i said earlier that if i was going to write something dark and horrific that i felt was out of my character that I would probably feel more comfortable to put it under a different name. So I guess in that way I'm being hypocritical. Well, then maybe you should put everything under a different name so that you don't have to worry about it coming back to Marshall Latham. Yeah. But it's too late for that, though, because he's created... Not he's got writer, a. Though. You've got fans that have read your true. stuff. You've On journey into you've put out your own things yeah. you put out a superhero story that you wrote in like eighth grade yeah and you wrote the one about the eyes of redemption the mirrors mirror mirror mirror, mirror yeah, on the wall which little is little yeah. mechanical mirrors in the church under your own name and and anyway it just something that you had said is like enough people know you as marshall latham now that you have fans and why not expand Ah, that's an ugly word, isn't it? Exploit? Is that an ugly <laughs> word? But why not take advantage of the goodwill that Journey Into has created by saying, if you like my podcast, you will like this novel that I've written, kind of thing, right? It seems wise. But at the same time, I understand that I, I am of two minds on this, because I don't want somebody to say, hey, you wrote this, and the main character didn't like Jews, so clearly you don't like Jews. Yeah. You can't deny that, then, is what I, you're trying to say? <laughs> should, should I have chosen something else? Do I go to the Jew well too often? Yeah, yeah, you don't want people to, to well, hate you for stuff that you write, obviously. It, but the the thing is, it's going to happen. 
There are going to be people that think that you're a bad person because you wrote this. There are going to be people that think you're possessed by the devil because you wrote a story that has a devil in it or that it has a something horrific or, you know, whatever. There's going to be people that do that. There's no way around it, whether you put it under whatever you name you put it under. I guess it's just something you got to deal with as a person that writes fiction. Most people, I think... Are smart. Wait, how does the saying go? People are dumb. Pers- a, person a person is, is smart. smart. Most persons, <laughs> especially those that read, are smart enough to be able to separate those things out. You know, when they make the movie version, then they'll hate you. But when they're the readers, they'll be smart enough to be able to tell the difference and, and see. And, yeah, I think that it shouldn't be a problem. I think think that people, especially if you have a big body of work out there, you know what I mean? Hopefully most people would give it more than one shot. You know, you've got like, we'll say you have 40 stories published. Somebody reads a story and they think, whoa, this is really pro-religious. What the heck's going on? I thought Rich Outfield wasn't like that. I would hope they would read one of the other stories and say, oh, well, this one wasn't like that. And this one wasn't like this one wasn't, this one wasn't like that. And this one wasn't, you know, and then They'll realize, hey, that's just a story, and this isn't Rich Outfield journal. I don't know. I mean, you you can only rely on person a person being smart, and uh, hope that people don't and, hate you. But you know, as long as they pay you money, who cares? <laughs> and if they're offended by it, you can say, well, "I'm sorry you feel that way," and move on. <laughs> Yeah, that is You can hard. never predict what people are going to be offended by. That's something that we have learned on our show. I don't know. Have, have, has there ever been a, a stink made for a, a journey into? Have you ever gotten like negative feedback for a story uh, because of the content? And I haven't, but you know, I don't get a lot of feedback. You haven't done much stuff about cats. People <laughs> need to. Uh, no, I have not. <laughs> people need to participate more in your forums and and stuff. Yeah, I, I don't know how to stir up more interest yeah. in there. And, and we've had no feedback, really, except for I think one person said they had listened to Delusions of Grandeur. But eventually somebody's going to hear that I don't like the prequels one time too many. <laughs> and they're going to make a stink about it. I would think, I, I, I don't know, if we had a million listeners to Delusions of Grandeur, it would be very, very different. And sometimes we'd have to like put our hand over the mic, right, and say, I don't know, should I rephrase that? What do you think? But having zero listeners is kind of uh, yeah, the, the the opposite end of the yeah. It's a, you can say whatever you want because no one will know. It's like talking to yourself in a cave way down at the bottom, except for with better sound. We've all typed something on Facebook or seen somebody type something on Facebook and had it taken the wrong way, yeah. or had it take you write a joke and people take it as not a joke. Mm-hmm. Maybe there's even a typo where you have the autocorrect or whatever, and one li- little letter or whatever, and you're like, oh, shoot, it looks like I said. You know, I was using the British word for uh, for underwear. <laughs> I was not using the word that it switched it to. And uh, I don't know what to do about that kind of thing. I guess hope that people are better. Hope that a pers- that persons are, <laughs> are smarter than that. Yeah, I think that's all you can do is just hope that persons will understand and... Uh... Just go with it. Put out your stuff and be who you are. Trust in persons to be understanding of that. And hopefully, maybe even they'll like that. I think we've run to the end of our conversation here. It seems like we're all just staring kind of off and nodding. Well, yes, we've been going for a very long long time. Um, And so, yes, uh, you can go on to Amazon and read my... uh, Lair of the Lesbian Love Goddess trilogy by Rish Outfield instead of the pseudonym I used to have. Lair Lair of the Lesbian Love Goddess was by Edward McEwen. That's not you. (laughs) Okay. Jeez, come on, man. Sorry, I'm just not creative enough to come up with a dirty title that... uh, (laughs) um, All right. Thanks for listening. The crappening. Oh, that's right. What what happened to the crap? (laughs) Hey, what happened to that, by the way? The poetry reading thing. Okay. The crappening, I think, is what you should call your collection of stories. <laughs> all, all, scatological. all scatological. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. I'm Big Anklin. Hey, uh, thank you, Marshall, for being with us today. You bet. It was fun. All right. And I'm Rich Outfield, too.
And I'm Marshall Layton. Yes, he is. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you. Be well. That Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license. Doesn't have to be, but it is.